Good to go. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Melissa McGee, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Himalayans. I'm a breeder, I'm a promoter, and I'm a judge. Um, I've been promoting the Himalayans for over 30 years now. Uh, first, I bought our first pair for my little sister when she was six years old because I knew they'd be a great breed for her to handle as a little six-year-old. Um, and then became a breeder once she went off to college myself and then handed them over to my little ones, uh, my son and my daughter, and they both have been showing Hemis and youth since then. And I've been a judge since about 2005, I believe. And so with that, first thing, what makes a Himalayan unique? And there's actually a couple things that make them a really unique breed. For one, there it goes, their type. Um, they are the only breed right now that has cylindrical body type. They should look like a cylinder when they're posed out, nice and straight and round and flat. The other thing that makes them really unique is their markings. There are other breeds, of course, that have Himalayan marked varieties, but the Himalayan is an original. Um, even Californians got their markings from Himalayans. So it makes them really unique um, there because they have these markings and they were the first. And the other thing that really makes them unique is their personality. And by that, I mean, they're just very docile and very easy to handle. Occasionally you'll get a doe that's a little bit grumpy, <laughs> but everybody has does that are a little bit grumpy. Um, these guys are just, for the most part, extremely docile, extremely easy to handle. And it's really nice from a judging perspective too, because you can handle them so easily and um, compare Himalayans to one another. So we're gonna start with their type. Their type is cylindrical, as I said, the only cylindrical breed, and it's worth 41 points in our standard. The standard basically, if when it, you boil it down to just a couple things, it says they should be long and straight. And if you look at these three examples that I have up here, um, they all show really good Himalayan type. Um, they should look like a paper towel tube or a Pringles can. I'm sure all of you that are interested in Himalayans have heard this said many times before. Um, and by a, a tube or a, a Pringles can, what we mean is that they are round all the way around. They're not squished. They're not wide this way or squished from the sides. They are perfectly round all the way around. Um, and you can see that in these three, their height approximates their width. Um, and I wish I had the exact same rabbit to show you top and bottom, but these animals are very similar um, in terms of type. And you can see the nice evenness of the top line across those two does on either side. And then on the one in the middle, you can see the nice evenness of the side lines. She's even all the way down from the shoulders to the hips. Very little taper or graduation in size. Um, this balance is really important to a Himalayan, just like it's any other breed. And just like any other breed, you need to make sure that they are posed correctly. So this is another thing that's unique about Himalayan. Um, they are posed basically the same, but um, the front feet are underneath the eyes, just like you would uh, any other breed. You can see on the far picture there um, on my left side, there's uh, the feet right underneath the eyes. The back feet are underneath the hips. But the difference is, is that when you pose them out, you're going to slightly lift the back end of the animal and stretch them to their farthest extent and then place those back feet down. One thing that's a common mistake is you'll see that uh, hawk come up and out, and it'll actually be up a little bit um, in the back. And, and all of these have their hawks completely flat on the ground. Um, anyway, you wanna make sure that those hawks are flat down and that they aren't pitching up um, and causing the whole hind end to come up. Um, a few people have asked me about the hind end um, from the pin bones, and you can kind of see that's um, at the hind quarter there. It's kind of the, the tallest point there. There's typically a nice gradual decrease down towards the tail. 
um, and it can be a little bit rounded. Um, it can come at a little bit more of an angle, but you don't want it to just chop off. You want it to have that nice gradual um, turn down to that tail. And when I pose them out, I like to pose them out with that tail flat on the table as well and not sticking up. Um, I know a lot of times for showmanship, the kids want to put those tails straight up, but I think that that adds to the extra length of the rabbit by having that little bit more length with that tail. It's just very pleasing to the eye. So anyway, those are some of my tips for posing. Now, there's other ways you can pose a hemi. Uh, one thing that I've seen and probably a lot of you have seen is the rocking motion. You just kind of rock the rabbit back and forth from side to side. And that works with some rabbits. Some rabbits don't like it. Um, and uh, anyway, that's, that's another rolling pin motion is what they call it. Um, another method that some people use. So make sure they're posed correctly. Think about balance and think about that nice, even cylindrical tube all the way down the animal. The next thing that makes Himalayans really unique is their markings. Um, again, markings are worth 41 points. So markings and type are the same amount of points. Um, now with that said, type is something that is pretty much permanent. That's the way the rabbit's gonna look. Um, markings come and go, and we'll, I'll be talking about this throughout. Um, they're unique in that their color and their markings can fade if it's warm or can become really deep and in, large and intense if it's cool or cold. So markings, 41 points. Let's just talk about the shape of markings on this slide. I've got all kinds of examples here. Um, the first one where I have three pictures of the same rabbit, that's just to show the different markings. And you can see um, we've got the egg on the nose that can either be called smut, um, nose smut, or you can call it an egg. I prefer egg. If you were to take a piece of paper and trace around an egg, um, an actual egg, and place it on that rabbit's nose, that's the exact right shape for those, those nose markings. Um, the small end of the egg should come up around um, between the eyes. And you can see that really well on the little doe at the very end, where I've got the two nose markings facing you. Um, and then the larger part of the egg should come into the whisker bed and should really encircle that whisker bed. You can see it's a little bit blunt on the one on the left and a little bit jagged, but it's still got very good size to it. Then there's the ear base and you can see nice clean ear base on that one. Same with the two little does on the other side. You can see a nice clean ear base on both of them. Then we're gonna look at um, his leg markings. And I call the front leg markings socks. That's my terminology. There's a few other judges that also refer to them as socks. The standard refers to the back leg markings as boots. So when I talk about it, it's gonna be socks on the front legs, boots on the back legs. Um, the socks need to come up high. They need to come up as high as they can up to that elbow joint the way these are or the way the lilac is in the middle. Um, those are excellent height on those socks. The boots should look like a little boot on the rabbit. It should cover the um, hind leg and the hawk, of course, and come up the hind leg and make a nice circle around the top there without any jaggedness or unevenness. Again, height is desired. Then um, the next marking, we talked about nose and the feet and legs. Um, the tail marking is basically the tail needs to be colored and have good color. There's really not a lot of description on it beyond that. Then there's the ears, and that ear base needs to be nice and clean um, and circle around the ear. Um, just no jaggedness at the bottom. Pretty easy on the ear. Although a lot of times, if you're going to see stray white hairs, you'll see them on that ear. So just a place to look for it. So well colored, clean cut, and well defined. Those are all words that describe all of the markings um, in the standard. All right, next is color. And color, I don't have points really for it other than um, body color is three points. The other color is actually part of markings. So they're together. Um, and color is really, so obviously color is really important because it's part of that 41 points for markings. So we have the <clears throat> pure white body, which is worth three points. Um, obviously not a lot of points for that, but it's typically not a problem. They, 
typically have a nice clean white body to them. Um, and then we have the three main colors. And I'm, I'm going to call them the three main colors. They, they were the, the first three colors. So we have black, blue, and chocolate. And they are all described very similarly as being rich, dark, intense. So that's what we're looking for. The color on the dough that's on the very far where it says body pure white, she's actually a blue. Um, and so you want that kind of intensity in your varieties, that really deep blue color. Um, you can see the blue and black that are in the middle, the blue looks a little bit more washed out. And I, part, of, part of that is the lighting in the picture, but you can see that um, that's the difference between the black and the blue there, but you can see that black again, really intense in color. The fourth color that I haven't really talked about yet is the lilac. They need to be a medium dove gray with a hint of pink to the tip of the color. And so I have three babies here and they're all 10 to 12 week old babies, so they don't have full color yet. Um, on the one side, I have a blue, and then the lilacs in the middle, and then the chocolate is on the right side. And you can see from the um, picture here, the blue is that, again, really intense, dark blue. It's a rich color. And you can already see that on the nose and on the top part of the ear. The base of the ear hasn't finished yet, um, that's something that does finish a little bit later. So don't stress out when you see the ear bases uneven and when they're babies, that usually comes in a little later. Then you can see the lilac and you can see that pinky hue kind of coming over the top of the nose um, and up on the ear a little bit. And then the chocolate on the other side, um, it's that again, really deep, intense chocolate color on the nose and the ears haven't quite finished yet. Going back to the lilac in the middle, um, that should be a medium shade of lilac. In my opinion, that one looks a little dark right now. Um, it may change slightly as it ages, um, but you do want a medium shade, not the really dark, rich shade that the others are. And like I said before, the point color is part of the markings. So together with markings, 41 points. All right. My... <laughs> My last thing that makes Hemis unique is their personality. They have a big personality for a little rabbit. I mean, these, these rabbits only weigh two and a half to four and a half pounds. So they're not a really big rabbit, even though they have lots of length and may appear to be a little bit larger. Easy for kids to handle. They have a great personality. They're very inquisitive. Um, we give them toys in a lot of their cages because they are so inquisitive that they'll knock water bottles off frequently. And um, if you lay anything on top of the cage, it'll be in the cage because they pull everything through. So they, they are very inquisitive. Um, leave a door open and they're out. Um, where the satins that we also raise tend to just sit and they don't care. Um, but anyway, so personality, big on these guys, but they're very docile and sweet. How many points is it worth? Zero. But from a judge's perspective, sometimes even though it's worth zero points, it can be worth everything. If you have a rabbit that doesn't sit and um, pose properly and wants to hunch up or wants to lift their tail up in the air, um, it can be really hard to deal with. And even from a breeder's perspective, if you're trying to evaluate the rabbits, you want a rabbit that's gonna sit and be docile and be, be easy to examine. So personality can, is zero points in the standard, but sometimes everything. Um, so I've got three pictures here. I've got the little girl on the side. Yes, that's my daughter at one of the county fairs when she was little. And you can see she's easily got that rabbit turned over. She's demonstrating something to the little boy that's there with his parents um, and just no, not a problem at all. She doesn't have, even have long sleeves on, so <laughs> she's not worried about it. Um, very easy to handle for little kids and for adults. Then um, the middle picture, this is from a national Hemi show. And you can see he's about to line up his fourth Hemi in a row and they're not going anywhere. They're just sitting there. It's one of the real delights of, sh of judging this breed. And it, local show or at a national show, is that you can pose them up all together and then not only from a uh, judge's perspective, but from the breeder's perspective, I can see exactly what those rabbits look like all lined up. And typically, you know, we've been, if we've been in the business long enough, we can point out, you know, what's wrong with each one of them. 
So, um, but I do have to say this was a really competitive class of black senior does and they look gorgeous all lined up. Not a lot of fault in them. Um, the beautiful markings on all of them for sure. And just slight things different with the type, but being able to pose them all together, you can see those slight differences. And then the last picture, now I'm going over to the left. I, I went reverse this time. Um, this is me, of course, and um, I'm judging at the Portland ARBA convention. It was open Himalayans, and I'm down to um, the final run. So this is my me searching and looking over the two rabbits that I've picked for best of breed. And uh, it's coming down to, you know, type and markings, of course. They both have beautiful coats. They're in great condition. Um, markings looked really spot on, although I'm double checking on that lilac doe. And it came down to the black doe is just a little smoother in her body type and had a little bit of extra length in her body type, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's pretty exciting when it comes down to just that last little bit. And for me that day, it was the length of body that um, really tipped it to the black doe for best of breed at that convention. The lilac doe though, I fell in love with her and she was put in our Himalayan auction and we brought her home. So we, we paid a pretty penny for her, but that goes to support the club. And that's also why we're doing this hobby is to support one another. So, um, yep, the Lilac Doe, uh, Fluffy Butt, I think was her name, um, came home and, and lived with us. All right, one more point here um, that is worth 10 points is fur. So the fur on a Himalayan is flyback. And so in other words, when you stroke the rabbit from the tail to the head, uh, the coat returns relatively quickly on a Himalayan. It's short, it's fine, it's silky. I'm hoping in this picture, you can really see that silkiness. Um, I feel like I can reach out and touch it from here. Um, it, it has a finer hair shaft. It, it, just a silky kind of texture to it. Um, and it does return really quickly. So that's, that's what you're looking for ideally on their fur. With that said, um, fur and condition of the rabbit often go hand in hand. So if you have an animal that's just in poor physical condition, maybe they're uh, rough or bony, then typically their coat is also a bit rough um, and out of condition. And then another part of fur good fur that's shorter like this coat is um, and not long and shaggy can really enhance the markings. And I don't care whether it's Himalayans or one of your other marked breeds like a Spot or a Rhinelander, um, that shorter coat that's really in good condition will make the spots rounder, will make the, the egg rounder, will um, improve the roundness of the leg markings. So um, fur can really enhance your markings. All right, most common disqualification is smut, hands down. Um, there's not a show that I've judged Timmy's at that I haven't found smut on a rabbit and I'm not digging for it, it's just there. Uh, first of all, what is smut? It's a dark city appearance on the usable portion of the pelt. So what's the usable portion of the pelt? That's basically from anything from the neck down, excluding the markings. So not on the feet and legs, of course, and not on the tail. Any smut on the head is okay. Um, it's a, just a minor fault. But um, smut, like what you would find in the nest box when the babies are born, sometimes they get chilled and they'll have a kind of a gray sootiness all over them and that's smut. Um, it's, some people call it nest box stain. I know there are certain people that just overlook it and they'll still show the rabbit, but from a judge's perspective, smut is smut. And if I see it on a baby rabbit or on a junior, um, it's gonna be disqualified. So um, keep your juniors at home until they've uh, shed out that first coat and gotten in their, their good junior coat. Now, sometimes that means you wait until they're five months old. And typically that's when your juniors do their best anyway, because their markings have fully come in at that point. 
Another place that's pretty common is um, hip smut, and you can see that one is down low in the middle. Um, but sometimes those pin bones I talked about before that are on their hindquarter, um, sometimes you'll see two nice little bullseye smut spots right there, um, another very common spot. And then another very common spot is along the spine. And this is a picture of the back of a, the Himalayan. And <laughs> this one's gotten out of control. The spine smut has pretty much covered the entire saddle from side to side. A lot of times it'll just go down the spine, just down the very center, um, almost like a herringbone um, spine marking on a uh, English spot. Um, but again, a disqualification and super common to see. Now, why is it certain areas? We know with the nest box smut that it's because they were babies and they got chilled when they were little, but why, not, why do the others come up? Typically, it's because those are areas where there isn't enough um, fat covering that bony part. So they got a little chilled there. Um, so along the spine, there's typically not as much fat covering them. And then those two pin bones that tend to stick out, there's typically not enough fat covering that hind quarter. So then you see the smut. And then sometimes you'll see it down the middle of their belly. And that's just from resting on the cold wire sometimes. Um, You'll also see the little runs off of the egg, little lines of color, and that can be from a metal feeder that they're eating out of if it's particularly cold. Um, you can see it anywhere on them. If you give them a frozen water bottle and they rest up against it during um, coat transition when they're growing a new coat, they can have smut down the sides of their body from the um, frozen water bottle. So. You have to be careful. Um, really cold, cold surfaces can create smut. All right, there's some other disqualifications that you need to pay attention to. And um, this is just a picture for a picture to show me looking over an animal. Uh, dew laps. That's pretty common on those older senior does. They, they'll be probably right at that top four and a half pounds. They might even be overweight. Um, and then they develop that little dewlap. Maybe you're showing a, a doe that's already had a litter and she's developed a dewlap because she's gotten a bit hefty. Um, so dewlap, something to look for it as a disqualification. Not necessarily something I would cull for unless it showed up on a really young rabbit. Uh, white spots in the markings. This is a very distinct white spot. So several white hairs making a spot within the colored section, not to be confused with some other marking faults. Um, I'll show you some other marking faults in the future slide. But um, yeah, very clean and distinct white spot in the marking is a disqualification. Now, white toenails is not, it's called out in the standard, but um, it's not breed specific, obviously. Um, any breed can, if they got the wrong colored toenails can be disqualified. Uh, but white toenails on any of your dilutes is very common. Um, we had a few blue Himalayans 20 years ago that um, were getting white toenails. And it's typically that first toenail next to the dew claw on the front foot that's white and the others are dark. Um, that one we did have to cull for. And as soon as we started culling for it, it disappeared within a year. Um, and we haven't had any white toenails ever since. So cull hard for things like this um, and you won't get them again. Same thing with the white spots. If you were to develop white spots or stray white hairs, like a lot of them throughout on your ears, um, then those are things you'd wanna cull for to make your animal stronger or your line stronger, I should say. All right, common faults. So let's start with type, poor top line. Remember in the very beginning, I talked about nice, straight, smooth top lines. That's what you want. A poor top line is typically seen when you look at the nice straight shoulder and then there's a dip right after the shoulder or sometimes it goes along and then there's like a sway back over the saddle. Um, those are both things that um, you need to really pay attention to. It's something we call for in our barn um, to make sure that we always have a nice straight top line. Short length. Now, short, a short body length is not something that I would necessarily call for. I'm always striving for a longer length of body, but sometimes you have to 
deal with a little shorter animal because that animal is extremely smooth or comes into markings extremely quickly or well. Um, but short length is a common fault. Uh, bulky or flared hip. Um, you'll hear people that use both terms. Uh, and you can see that in this picture. This rabbit is both short and he has a bad flare at that hip. Um, heavy bone, you don't want a heavy bone on a hemi. Uh, medium to light bone is, is uh, what you need to be looking for. And then you can also think about it from a breeder's perspective. Um, if you have more of a medium weight bone, then you typically have a little longer body type. They go together. Um, if you have a finer bone, then the rabbit tends to be a little bit um, shorter. And it's okay because it's just, it's a smaller animal. It's a little more balanced that way. So always keep balance in the, in the back of your mind. And then the other thing is potty or fat. Um, we don't want fat hemis and we don't want potty midsections. And you can see on him, he's got a little bit of a potty midsection, probably from hay. Um, if you're evaluating your babies, uh, give them a pass on a potty midsection if you just fed them a bunch of hay in the last couple days because they will develop a hay belly basically. <laughs> And so, um, but you don't want to see that on the judges. The judges don't want to see that on their show tables. So um, that's something that you need to pay attention to, look, look for. Markings, let's move over to markings and um, have a good example here of some poor markings or marking faults. Um, small, short, you can see that that nose marking doesn't come into the whisker bed. That's a very small marking. Those legs, um, they don't go all the way down to the elbow really short. Undefined lines, um, you can see that on the back leg, it's got um, a lot of mealiness at the top. Uh, frosty, um, you can see that again at the top of that back leg. And a lot of times uh, on the body picture that I have over here, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it kind of has a frostiness to those ears and that's just where they haven't colored in yet. Um, barring, and you can see the barring on that front leg there where the white comes in. Now that's not a white spot. I promised I would point that out to you. Um, that is just barring, um, so it's just a fault. So ragged, uneven, brassy. Brassy actually comes from uh, markings that have either been exposed to too much sunlight or too much heat, and that's where you see those blacks that almost look like they're chocolate. They're they're more of that sepia color coming through rather than the really intense black color that they should be. Uh, stray white hairs we talked about. And then it's our standard list eye stain as a minor fault. Eye stain looks like eyebrows. Um, they typically go over the top of the eye. Sometimes they'll go all the way around the eye. And um, eye stain, again, just a minor fault. Typically your rabbits or your Himalayans that have the really big intense markings um, that are really desirable will often have a little bit of eye staining. Um, minimal eye staining is you know, great, no problem. I pretty much overlook it. A lot of eye staining, again, just a minor fault. Everything else being equal, the one with the minor eye or with the eye stain is gonna be second. But um, anyway, just a minor fault that I need to point out. Now, the reason that it's not smut and disqualified is because it's on the head. Again, not the usable portion of the pelt. All right, so I spent a lot of time talking about temperature and markings and smut, and it all comes down to temperature and climate. Um, excellent color and markings are genetic, um, but they depend on the correct climate and temperature in your rabbitry. Um, so what I mean by that is you're selecting for animals that in your temperature and climate um, are going to have the best markings possible. And so that's the genetic aspect of it. Now, what you need to do is have your barn set up so that the temperature is typically around 60, 65 degrees, and that you also have very good airflow. Both of those things are key. Um, I also have lower light in my barn. Um, it's typically not super bright in there. And um, anyways, the 60 degrees and good airflow, they're essential to bring out the best in all your rabbits. So it doesn't matter whether you raise hemis 
or another breed, um, airflow and temperature control are super important. It helps bring on that good coat, the good condition, and with your hemis, that'll give you your excellent markings. I got a couple pictures here, some ideas. Um, we use box fans in the window that's at one end, and that um, pulls all of the air through the barn and out of the barn. On the other end of my barn are um, swamp coolers. So um, they do add humidity to our environment or to their environment, but I live in California and it's dry. So typically a couple of swamp coolers running in there, um, it might get up to 70% at times during the summer, but typically it doesn't really affect us at all. Um, if you don't, if you live in a humid environment, then obviously you'd want to be working with air conditioners rather than swamp coolers uh, or evaporative coolers. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, the other things I have going is um, the roof of my barn has the um, turbines that help bring the hot air out of the um, roof part, um, the top of the barn. And it also has a sprinkler system running across the top. When it gets over 90 degrees, we usually turn that on during the summer to help cool the roof down. And we have a line of sycamore trees um, that shade the roof partially. So those are all you know, really good things to help keep the environment cooler. Um, some of it's kind of passive so that it's not costing you a lot extra, like the trees and the um, roof turbine. Um, and the sprinklers don't really cost a whole lot either once you've got them set up, a little bit of water. And um, others do cost more money like an air conditioner or an evaporative cooler do. Um, but it, for me, it's worth it. Um, it really does help with the, the, both the health and the condition and the markings of all my rabbits. All right, so then I've got kind of a memorable moment of mine. I know I shared one earlier, um, Portland and that hard decision between the two does. Um, but this, I, I think a lot of times for us judges, um, one of our most memorable moments is probably the first big show that we are asked to judge. And so mine was um, Indianapolis in 2005 and they had a large Himalayan entry. There was over a hundred, I think, in youth. And so they asked me to judge youth and they just had the other judge do open. I think he had like 200 in open. So um, anyway, it was, it was really a, a good experience for me. And it taught me how to um, work with a large class of rabbits. And my large class came in my black senior does, of course. Um, it's typically the most competitive class, so it's an exciting class to judge, um, but it's a lot of black senior does. <laughs> so um, I learned really quickly um, how to separate my class into threes, and that's how I judge any large class now. Um, fortunately, at a convention, they typically have holding coops, so the animals that really excite me when I first pull them out and evaluate them, they go in the back. Um, that way I don't have to even think about them. They're my top animals and they're behind me. Then I can separate my um, middle of the class and my bottom of the class. And I use coins, any kind of markers work. Um, but this goes for kids too. You only have four rabbits you have to look through when you're doing a judging contest, but you can think of it exactly the same way. You might have the first and second might be your very best animals and you wanna just, don't, for, don't think about them right now. Think about your third and fourth place. Get those in position and then go back and decide which one's gonna be first and which one's gonna be second. Um, it's just a really easy way to manage your classes. If you start thinking about your first place all the way down to place 50, you get yourself really confused. So have a marker system to help you, you know, if it's red, white, and blue uh, coins or ribbons or whatever, um, and don't change it up. If blue is your best ones, then always make blue your best ones. Um, that's another thing that a judge mentor told me a long time ago, and it really stuck with me. So I always make, keep my coins exactly the same and I never change it up. Even when I think that people on the other side of the table know what I'm doing and have figured out my system, it doesn't matter. Because I don't, in the end of the day, it's just to keep me straight so that I place the animals correctly. So anyway, that was one of my uh, more memorable uh, 
times. And this um, doe that I'm posing here, I believe was my best of breed. And you can see she's nice and smooth and long and um, just really a beautiful animal. So I've got some pictures up here. And I just wanted to point out some different things about them because they do have, a, there's a couple different styles here. Um, I have a lilac up in the top corner, up in the top left corner. And um, he's, you can see he's a little bit dark for a lilac. Again, it could be the lighting. Um, he does have a little bit of that eye stain around the top of his eye. But look at how smooth his um, top line is. And he's got some great length of body too. Then the doe that's right next to him on the top, she looks a little bulkier in that back end, but one thing I like about this doe is, I, I, I'm hoping that you can really see this, is the muscling of the doe. She was um, a very well-conditioned animal, super muscular all the way back, and just felt really nice underneath your hands because of that. Then the two pictures on the bottom are actually the same rabbit. Um, they are the only rabbit to my knowledge that's won a group at convention. Um, and uh, the only Himalayan to my knowledge that's won a group at convention. And it's a little black junior doe. And you can see that I <laughs> was in a big hurry to take the picture that's on the left. And um, her back hawk is up in the air. Uh, the front foot isn't right underneath the eye where it should be. Um, it's just not a very good picture and her egg even looks a little bit funny where probably I had a finger there that messed up the side of her nose. Now the one with all the awards and accolades behind her is a much better picture of her. You can see that she's smooth and straight and cylindrical in type. She's a young animal, she's just five months. And so she's got that lighter bone already, or still. And um, so she doesn't have quite the length of body that you've seen in some of the other pictures that I've shown you, but she still has adequate length. Um, let's see. Oh, I know the other thing I wanted to point out is in the top pictures, you can see where those hawks are just slightly up, not bad like the one on the bottom, but they are slightly up. That's kind of a natural curvature that the hawk does. If you look at the rabbit's foot, there is a slight curvature to it. Um, and so you can get away with just a little bit of a bump up in the back. Um, and the rabbit's still pretty flat on the table. But for the most part, um, the lilac buck, he's posed really nicely. And so is the one in the opposite corner, the little black doe, uh, with that hawk flat on the table and those front feet underneath the eyes. And so those are pretty ideal. Just some more pictures. I think the more good examples that you can look at of a breed, um, the better uh, picture you'll develop in your mind. So I'll leave you with that. And this is my sleeping Himalayan. He has some issues too. His hawk is a little bit cocked up and he's got a little bit of a sway back. He's not quite as um, flat across that top line. But we were taking pictures of all different types of himmies at one of the conventions and he just looked like he was falling asleep there and anyway so we got this great shot at this point are there